Welcome to Cherry Records Government Contracting Podcast. My name is Bryn McNeil, and I'm an audit partner with a focus on serving government contractors within our professional services industry group. Along with me today, I have Craig Hunter, who is also an audit partner in our GovCon professional services industry group. Today, we'll be focusing on accounting best practices for 8A companies as part of Cherry Beckert's SBA 8A Business Development Program series that we've been doing recently. By the end of this podcast, we are hopeful you'll have some good tips and tricks to take away. All right, let's get started. Craig, do you mind just kicking us off talking about what um, an accounting system should look like and how maybe to get that set up for companies? Absolutely. Thank you, Bryn, so much. Well, good day, everyone. So when you're looking at the accounting system, you have to think of it in a chart of accounts and really having a simple convention um, in your in your accounting system and really grouping like items together. For example, the 1,000 accounts would be your assets, the 2,000 accounts would be the liabilities and carrying on with equity, revenue and costs. Um, again, the key is to really group these accounts together such that when you're pulling your internal statements, your balance sheet and income statement, they're extracted in a way that they're going to need the least amount of manipulation as, as you're going to be pulling these very, very regularly. So um, think about that when you're putting the, the accounting system and chart of accounts together. Another item to be very mindful of when you're setting up your accounting system is, is the concept of indirect rates. Um, and these would be um, rates that are not direct charges, but really indirect fringe, general and administrative and overhead type rates. So even though it may not be necessary for you to submit this indirect rate information to the DCAA or Cognizant Agency, we would recommend and suggest that the chart of accounts is set up in a way that all these expense types are grouped together in these pools of fringe, overhead and GNA um, so that one can still calculate indirect rates because this is really important for you when you're going to be pricing contracts, even though all contract types, TNM, um, cost plus and, and fixed price, you really need to know what your, your underlying cost is and having the indirect rate information available will really help you in that regard. Um, and here the, the concept of a wrap rate comes into play, which is really the factor by which you multiply a dollar of direct labor or direct expense to get to the fully burdened rate, which is really your cost as a, as a provider. Um, so really be mindful of, of that. So setting up the system to segregate your costs, direct and indirect is, is important. You have to be able to accumulate costs by contract um, and also allow for the distribution of labor between direct and indirect cost objectives. Um, and lastly on this is really, you need to be able to, to, to sec separate and segregate your unallowable costs as, as defined. So really a few things to think about as you're setting up the, the accounting system. Bryn, do you wanna kind of kick over to you to talk a little bit about the, the reporting and, and what functionality you need to bake in? Yeah, that's great. Um, so just kind of in general, there are some accounting softwares um, that we typically do see our clients using. We tend to be agnostic when it comes to recommending or encouraging one over the other. Um, but I would say kind of three systems that we typically see a lot of our clients and prospects using um, would be, you know, Delta, Costpoint, Uninet, and even QuickBooks Online, we've seen some companies be able to use that, but it's just really important that regardless of the system that you're using, that the system is able to help generate some key reports that are really critical when it comes to being able to get through, um, especially an audit or even a review, but just to have a good financial hygiene for the company. Um, you mentioned one being you know, a, a report that can really show by contract your direct costs, your indirect costs um, included in that would be your revenue. So, being able to see that contract revenue summary or job cost report um, is really critical for companies to be able to produce and review. It's also just a really good way for um, project managers to be involved to make sure that they're actually able to track kind of how well um, a job and a contract is performing and if kind of that profit and loss is in line with it, what they were expecting based on kind of their understanding of the performance and their review. Um, equally important, and this is kind of regardless of whether you're in the GovCon industry or not, but 
you know, it is really important that you're maintaining those monthly bank reconciliations and balance sheet account reconciliations, be it your AR aging, your AP aging. You know, it's very important that your balance sheet reconciles out to each of the respective um, summaries and reports. There is one piece I would say that is a little more unique for the GovCon industry, and that's really being able to track and monitor um, your unbilled receivables or what now is kind of known as those contract assets or liabilities, but really being able to monitor what that unbilled um, really looks like. There's many different reasons that the unbilled um, receivables account does come up, be it from a timing difference, being it from milestone billings that may be incurred on your fixed price contracts, um, whether it's an indirect rate adjustment, if you're doing cost type work, but it's just critical that you're tracking that and maintaining um, a true reconciliation by job of what that unbilled amount is. And all of these reports are just, like I said, really critical when it comes to being able to prepare not only internal financial statements for management, but especially if you're going through an external review or an audit, it is going to be critical that you've got that audit trail and those good financial record keeping um, reports. Craig, that's do you want to just, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, but I think that's exactly right. And <laughs> and really, just one, other, one thing to add with the, with the new accounting system is, is to remember not to think about your your current needs, but just what you're going to be needing in the future and where you plan to go. You know, may, you might need inventory as a, as a separate a, account, and and really the accounting system one chooses should be one that is able to grow and develop um, with the company as it as, as moves along, either in the 8A program or even beyond that. So just to just to add that, you know, the accounting con system conversion is a is a large endeavor, and the the least amount of times a company can go through that is certainly the the better. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and that's a really good point. And sometimes it too is a, a system can be fine when you're maybe just starting out and growing, but definitely looking ahead is a really really good point. Um, one piece I mentioned on the unbilled receivables is that the term contract asset or liability, which may be um, hopefully familiar for many people out there, but it has been more of a newer concept as of you know the past few years. But do you want to highlight some of the accounting pronouncements that the industry has seen over the past couple of years as it relates to really revenue and leases? Absolutely, yes, and they they have been big and and. It, certainly within the industry have, have been very impactful. So the first one, as you mentioned, everyone is on revenue. And um, we know that as ASC 606, the accounting standards codification, 606 is the, the number of the um, of the codification. And that really requires that company work through a, a very formulaic five-step process to determine when revenue is appropriately recognized and recorded. One common error we see with with companies that are new, you know, to the space perhaps, or haven't got an understanding of six or six, is just to record revenue is equal to billings. And that, while it may be the case, it it may not be the case either. Um, you know, if one has cost reimbursable work or fixed price work uh, that's not level of effort, um, there certainly would be. Um, additional revenue recognition items to to think of, which really would kind of impact those unbuilt accounts that Bryn spoke about a little earlier. So briefly, the ASC, ASC 606 requires companies to go through a five-step process to determine when revenue is recorded, and I'll briefly go through those. The first one is to identify the contract. Which you know has all the key terms and conditions with the with the customer. The second one would be to identify the performance obligations. You know what what is it that the company is obligating itself to do? Is there a service element? Is it just professional services? Is there product? Uh, you know what is it that you're doing? And some contracts can be pretty um, pretty large and complicated, and there can be a number of different performance performance obligations baked into a into a single award. The third step is really to determine the transaction price for the contract as a whole. The fourth step would be to allocate that price to the respective performance obligations. And that's where it can get a little bit tricky as to how much of the revenue um, gets gets coded and, and really assigned to each. And the fifth and last step is to record and recognize the revenue when the underlying performance obligation is ultimately satisfied. Now, that can be at a point in time or over time, depending on when the customer really gets control of, of the good or service. So 
So that's uh, there's a lot of information out there. I know Cherry Beckett has a number of podcasts and, and webinars on ASC 606, but there's, um, there's, there's a lot out there which will help you understand that. Uh, the next item Bryn mentioned is leases, uh, and this is a little bit more current. ASC 842 uh, came to be and was effective for the year ended really essentially from January 1, 2022, uh, but for most companies for the year ended 2022. And this essentially, this standard essentially requires companies to bring onto the balance sheet the impact of um, all leases. And um, importantly, and the big change is really uh, for those operating leases, which were historically just expensed as incurred, and there may have been a small deferred rent element on the balance sheet. But now the standard requires that you, you value the, the full duration of the lease and bring that on as what they call a right of use asset onto your balance sheet and a corresponding lease liability on the um, on the balance sheet on the on the liability side and during the course of the lease the, the liability gets gets reduced and the right of use asset gets amortized the, the the impact to the to the income statement is not significant so it's really more balance sheet focus but um, certainly is one of the required standards and, and one that companies you know, have to have to do. So, Bryn, those are the two big ones, and um, hopefully, there's not going to be any more in the next little while. But those are the ones we're continuing to digest. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. And there, I will say, there has been some really good leasing software that's helped a lot of the software lines, but um, some good software that um, you know is out there that can help with that lease adoption. But hopefully, many companies at this point have kind of gone through both of those pronouncements and have those properly reflected on their financials. Um, Craig, do you want to just highlight some general housekeeping as it relates to the accounting department and best practices? Yep, absolutely. So a couple of things to 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 bring up here. The first one is for companies in the 8A program is just to be mindful of the reporting requirements because that can sneak up and I've had some where folks don't understand what reporting they need to do and suddenly they they're forced to do it in under you know very short time frame, and that um, that's stressful for everyone. So the first one is if the company is less than two million dollars in gross annual receipts, it's just to report to the to the SBA internal statement. So so no biggie there. However, if you go between two and eight million, then no two and two and ten million, you've got the review um, requirement. And over 10 million, then there is the um, the audit requirement. And just it's it's useful to understand what the the underlying audit or review is, because the the audit is a pretty rigorous process, which could take four to six weeks for a for an audit firm to to complete. And all of these financial these reporting requirements are all due 120 days after the after the end of the year. So certainly so to 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 bear those reporting requirements in mind. Yep, and for the review, that one I believe is due 90 days. So that one's even a more timely um, requirement for the companies that fall under that $10 million threshold. Yep, great, great point, yep, indeed. Uh, the next item is just for companies that don't have a line of credit with a, with a commercial bank is to really think about getting one, and even when they may not need it. Um, you know, it, it's so important for, com for companies to develop a relationship with a bank, and there are many banks in the industry, large banks, regional, smaller community banks, you know, that operate in this market. So getting um, connected with a bank and developing a relationship and being able to share with the bankers internal statements such that they get comfortable with um, with information that is provided is really important because um, at some point in time there's going to be a contract award and you're going to have to ramp up to to hire a lot of people perhaps and important to remember is that the cash cycle for a new contract is anywhere from 90 to 120 days sometimes even a little longer the cycle being the hiring of employees the performing of the work accumulating the costs and, and billing for the work and then finally cash collection so that that process of that that period of time can take 90 to 120 days so that's definitely something to you know to to bear in mind the and then really the the last couple controls and processes you know we always encourage companies to to think like big 
companies and 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 you know in, implement controls and processes, financial discipline, as Bryn mentioned earlier, doing all the reconciliations, but but just thinking like a large company and having those controls and processes and holding people accountable and maintaining really a, a discipline um, will really help um, in in the future. Uh, and lastly, in terms of items, just to just to be aware of housekeeping is really maintaining a backlog report both funded and unfunded, as this really gives companies and any other parties interested you know, visibility into the to the, the revenue that a company is going to have down the line. And it really is a good planning mechanism and, and tool. You know, too many times we've asked companies for the backlog report and they really don't have an idea. So really mapping out all the contracts that you've got, um, how much is funded, how much is not funded, just gives good visibility and just enables better management of, of the contract. So those are the items, Brynette, that, that, that we see often that I thought was be, would be good to, man, to, to mention here. Absolutely. Those are all great. And it is really important to consider thinking ahead, as you've mentioned many times throughout this podcast. But, um, you know, at some point the your company will graduate from being in the program and being in that full and open space. So these are all really tremendous things to think through now as you're planning ahead and for that future. Um, I know a lot of what you and I have talked about today can seem um, robust and a little overwhelming. So just to mention and to highlight that, you know, we do have many clients and prospects um, and work with companies that do outsource a lot of this, um, especially when it comes to their accounting. You know, there are companies, including Cherry Becker, that can help um, you know, really with the outsource piece and maintaining the accounting record keeping and helping prepare the uh, balance sheet reconciliations and the monthly close and the internal financials. Um, so it's definitely something that if you're not able right away to be able to do um, something to consider and maybe that's the right fit for your company for that time period and then you know down the road and as the company grows then maybe establishing more of an internal audit function and having the accounting in-house um, the other piece that we commonly see in addition to just the accounting being outsourced is that hr component and that's something too that sometimes we'll see companies um, kind of outsource everything from that perspective as well um, well, Craig, thanks again for joining me today. Um, as I mentioned, Sherry Beckard will be doing many more podcasts, especially as it relates to the SBA 8A Business Development Program, um, and we're hopeful that you'll join us for those. As always, these are posted on cbh.com, so if you've missed a podcast or want to go back and hear something again, they are always on the website. Um, if you have any questions or especially any needs, uh, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Craig. We're always here to help. Um, and just thanks again for joining.